This is the Mobile Tech Podcast, brought to you by worldpodcasts.com. Now here's your host, Tank Girl, Miriam Joie. Brought to you by Audible. Stay tuned for a special offer at the end of the show. Hi, and welcome to the Mobile Tech Podcast. I'm your host, Miriam Joie, and today is Thursday, July 7th, 2022. And I have Lisa from CNET on the show today. Hey, Lisa, how are you? Hey, I'm great. Thank you so much for having me today. Absolutely. You know, I've been wanting to have you on the show for a while, so I'm kind of excited. You know, I hear all these awesome things about you. So I think, oh, you know, thank you. <laughs> and I read your stuff. So I'm like, okay, we need to make this happen. Um, you saw the news. It's, you know, we're kind of that lull where like all kinds of stuff is going to explode in our face soon between the nothing phone and I'm sure there'll be the pixel and there'll be some galaxies and some iPhones. I mean, generally speaking, it's just going to be a nightmare soon. So, Oh yes. It's the calm before the storm right now. So <laughs> I'm, yeah, I'm not going to complain because okay, we're, we're good right now, but there are news and they're not too bad, not too crazy, which is nice. Um, the biggest thing I feel like, and you tell me what you think is possibly the Xiaomi 12 S series specifically because I love camera phones and because, well, this is the first new Leica partnership since Huawei. And that went really well. That was not a, we put our brand on our, on the phones kind of part. There was a deep partnership and this looks like another deep partnership. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah. Um, so it's interesting because I actually haven't covered Huawei and Xiaomi too much since I usually tend to focus on phones that are in the U.S. market. But For sure, yeah. I do think the one thing that stood out to me, I think, even more so than the, the Leica partnership when I was reading about this phone, was the giant sensor that it's right? going to have. I think that's really exciting. And I know, you know, a one-inch sensor on a phone isn't like, you know, a true one-inch sensor that you would get you know, on a DSLR or something like that. And it's not literally a whole inch when you look at like the technical aspects of it. But um, but I really think it's interesting to see phone makers paying more attention to the sensor size and the hardware in general, because I feel like a lot of the exciting advancements we've seen in the past few years have been more about, um, you know, the image processing side of things and computational photography and things like that. So I'm really excited to, to see how this phone does. Yeah, I feel the same as you. I mean, it's not the first time uh, a company has tried to push the envelope with, uh, you know, the sensors. The one inch is actually in reference to if you could fit the sensor in a one inch tube, because yes. it's from the TV tube days, right? Yes. <laughs> so it's not quite one inch, but it's a really big sensor. There's actually a teardown already out there by one of the Chinese uh, teardown people that <laughs> like the, the teardown people. I don't know those right. people. Whoever they um, are. Yeah. <laughs> and, and it's, it's huge. Like you have never seen a sensor this big on a phone and they came very close last year with the Xiaomi Mi 11 ultra. They've dropped the Mi branding this year, but the, uh, that was a pretty impressive phone. Honestly, I, I had it for a while and the, the image quality was phenomenal and it was, you know, not, it wasn't like a branded or anything. So the takeaway to me is this can only be an improvement and it's a bespoke sensor from Sony. And so this it kind of triggers for me, uh, some good thoughts because here's the thing. Huawei used to uh, basically work with Leica to, you know, get their color science, of course. That was always part of the deal. But they also did a lot of work around getting Leica to specify the lenses and the sensors. Right. So Leica wouldn't actually manufacture the stuff for them because, first of all, Leica makes none of their sensors. But they are always making their own lenses for their big cameras, like their, their line of, you know, dedicated cameras. So... With Huawei, they would specify the sensor and then Huawei would go to Sony and say, here are the specs, make us a sensor. And nobody else got that sensor. And we're seeing that happen again. This IMX989 is a bespoke sensor for Xiaomi that might eventually end up in another device if they don't have an exclusive partnership with Sony. Yeah, I thought I was reading about that, about how it's not exclusive to Xiaomi, but they did, like you said, kind of have some involvement in the development, which I think is really interesting. And I think that's going to make a big difference. You know, unlike Sony themselves with in the Xperia Pro-I, they actually uh, put a one-inch sensor in there from their uh, point-and-shoot cameras, their, their high-end point-and-shoots, and they cropped it, though. So this is not cropped. 
And it's got an eight element lens, which as we know is gonna make for big Z depth, meaning the distance from the lens tip to the sensor. It looks like it's somebody measured it and it's 1.1 centimeters. Like that's 11 millimeters. That's like a um, bit less than half an inch folks. So that's how thick the phone is gonna be in some places. Like you, you can't avoid that. Right, yeah, you, it, there's only so, you can only make it so small, right? Like there's only so much you can do. Yeah, and so I think the camera bump's gonna probably be tapered to make that look decent. But I don't really care about that. I'm super excited <laughs> about having a real one inch sensor with 1.6 micron pixels, 50 megapixels, pixel bin four to one to 12.5 megapixels for a whopping 3.2 microns per yeah. pixel and an f of 1.9 lens meaning super awesome, at least on paper, super awesome low light performance, right? Yeah, definitely. And you know what? I'm also really glad not just to see this focus on hardware, but this kind of shift away from focusing so much on the number of megapixels in a camera sensor, because I mean, we all know that's part of it, but it's not really the most important thing when it comes to image quality. It's a factor for sure. But, you know, you see other companies like Samsung that are just trying to cram more megapixels into a camera sensor. And, you know, it's nice to kind of see this focus on like the size of the sensor itself and then, you know, the the size of the pixels themselves. So um, I'm really excited to see what this means for low light performance, too, as you mentioned. Yeah. And then, of course, there's a trick OIS system on that that is the first OIS system to reset between frames. So it will go back to. So if you're actually moving, you're not doing a delta. You know, the problem with when you're shaking, right. the OIS eventually gets to the end of its limit and it can't move anymore. And then it has to reset. So what they're doing is they're resetting on each frame, meaning that it, it has the full travel distance again for the next frame. Um, that seems crazy, like uh, engineering wise, <laughs> but okay. Hopefully yeah. it, it is not a big hot mess because it's the first time, but you know, look at it this way. Apple has done the, um, in-body civilization and, and Oppo did the in-body civilization, the first Android phone with it, uh, on the Oppo Find X5 Pro, the Qualcomm version of it. And I think Vivo's doing it on one of their phones now too. I think the X80 Pro, but don't quote me on that. Uh, the point is that that was a thing and that worked out well. So uh, maybe, you know, this will be just fine. And I'm, I'm, I'm knowing Xiaomi, to be honest, yeah. I don't think it's going to be bad because Xiaomi's imaging pipeline has gotten really good. Like it started about what, two years ago or so. Like they were just like all of a sudden on it. Like I was like, wow, look at the photos coming out of these mid-range phones even. And now you can pretty much buy any Xiaomi phones, uh, Poco, Redmi, and just get a pretty decent imaging experience, even in the mid-range. So the other thing I wanted to bring up that I think is interesting is that they also, you know, didn't go crazy with the lens count, right? Like there's just right. three lenses, like, and the other two are Sony IMX586, which is the, the super popular, like... Remember how for a while every phone had a Snapdragon 765G? Oh, yeah. Yep. That right? definitely had a moment. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> and so the Sony IMX586 was kind of like that, but phone camera sensors. Right. All the OnePlus phones up to the OnePlus 8, like all the, almost all of the 6 and 7 series had it. It's still on some kind of lower end phones today. And it's a 48 megapixel sensor with 0.8 micron pixels. And it's probably the most well-tuned sensor in the world like it has had more devices with it launched and as such i think it has really great performance so seeing yeah. both of those with one of each in the telephoto which is a 5x periscope it looks like and on the ultra wide is actually pretty cool and the ultra wide has autofocus meaning it is used as a macro lens so whoo yeah, no, that's great. And I agree because I feel like sometimes, you know, there's so much focus on the main sensor that, you know, sometimes there's some compromise with like the ultra wide lens or the telephoto lens where color might not be as good or detail might not be as good. So it's nice to see that hopefully this won't be the case with this Xiaomi phone. Yeah, look, based on my experience with the Mi 11 Ultra last year, I think this is going to be amazing, especially if Leica got involved. And, yeah. you know, for Leica, it's it's the little details, like the way they coat the lenses, or at least they specify the coating. 
um, anti-reflection, anti-glare. The fact that they paint the inside of the space between the lenses black to absorb light so there's no weird, you know that kind of weird green dot effect you see on the iPhone when you do video? Yeah. That can be avoided by doing that kind of stuff. So it's very expensive. But this is not a cheap phone anyway. And it's also, you know, it's Xiaomi flexing. And Leica needed a new partner. Huawei is kind of stuck, right? They're like kind of right. like in molasses for a bit <laughs> until hopefully things yeah. can get better for them. So why not partner with Xiaomi to get all this uh, excitement on board? And I think this is what's got me really, really stoked about it. So there's two other phones, of course, they're lesser, but, you know, you can't, we can't, I mean, we can talk about them, but we, we can't. We have to spend, we had to spend most of our time talking about the Ultra, right? Yeah, the Ultra is honestly the one that caught my eye for, you know, all of the reasons we just mentioned. Um, you know, it, it's, and also I'm, I'm glad you brought up price because, you know, this isn't a cheap phone. It's called the Ultra, which that alone sig signals that it's going to be, you know, <laughs> a competitor to top tier flagship phones like the, you know, 13, iPhone 13 Pro and and the, um, you know, Galaxy S22 Ultra, but it's actually not as expensive as I kind of expected to see of a phone of that price. I mean, it, I think it it's around $900 when you, you know, convert it to US dollars, which is a lot, but honestly, is not that much for what it seems like you're getting with this phone. So I think that's, you know, a really interesting aspect of this too. Yeah, I feel like they've done a good job at being Xiaomi, which is always yeah. bringing value to the table somewhat, right? And um, that's good to see because none of their flagships have really peaked beyond a thousand euros or so. Yeah. Even the Mix series, which made of ceramic, was still like attainable. At the time, of course, phones were not as expensive, but I mean, the most recent Mix I haven't had my hands on, but there's been a few Mixes before that. They, the original mix for sure was like a very expensive phone at the time, but it never really went too crazy. Um, the other thing that sticks out for me here is that they're having a couple of custom chips for battery and charging management. That's not yeah. unusual. We generally use the, uh, the built-in Qualcomm stuff to do that, but they have their own. And the reason they do is because instead of splitting the battery into two cells, which is what any phone almost that does more than 50 watt charging does these days, because you can charge the two cells in parallel. Um, they're doing a single cell and they're using some kind of new chemistry, so probably inherited from the EV world, which is really interesting because they're using a single cell at up to 16 amp, which is, wow, a lot of current for a phone. So again, I trust that they're not doing anything stupid here and we're not going <laughs> right. to have the, you know, trog door, the burninating the peasants kind of <laughs> deal going on here. But um, right. this is an interesting development because that means, okay, that means that if they want to go to 120 or 135 watts, you double whatever, 67, you're going to get, you could do it with two cells, right? So you don't have to go quad cell, which is some some companies have been thinking of doing. Um, and then eventually, you know, the, the holy grail, the 240 watt that somebody's going to reach sooner or later you know I, I i hate on one hand that it's kind of a numbers game i know but at the same time having used some of these phones in some markets as i keep saying to folks that can't really relate to this it, it's really significant if you live in a place where you know and i i think the u.s is getting there slowly where uh the power grid is not reliable you might want to quick charge somewhere on the go and you don't want to just sit there for 30 minutes you want to right. plug in for five minutes 10 minutes and if you can get as much juice as you can in those five ten minutes it just makes a big difference right yeah i think one of the downsides i mean i totally agree with what you're saying i think regardless of your situation everybody wants to be able to charge their phone faster in a pinch especially because we rely on our phone for so many things now you know whether it's finding your way home or taking like a call for work or whatever. But, you know, you usually in most cases, you have to buy a specific power adapter and those power adapters can be kind of expensive. When I was reviewing the Galaxy S22 lineup earlier this year, I my jaw kind of dropped a little bit when I saw that Samsung's 45 watt charger is like $50. That's wow. like, yeah, that's like a significant cost that you're adding to like the overall device to get that benefit. And to be honest, I didn't see that much of a difference. 
watts when I was, you know, between the 25 and the 45 watt charging. Um, you know, it wasn't significant enough to spend $50 in my opinion. So uh, I definitely think there's a lot of room for improvement there. But I also feel like we need to watch out for some of those hidden costs that come with, you know, getting those improvements. Well, the good news is most Chinese manufacturers ship with their chargers. I think Xiaomi yes. in some markets ships without the charger, but you can ask for it and they include it for free. So it's more of a, let's That's optimize bad, yeah. the supply chain and let's optimize the, the amount of waste we create, but we're not going to charge the customer more. In this case, you'll probably want to say yes, because I bet you the charger is a big part of that system. Right. Um, and I wouldn't be surprised if it's just like included in the first place. What uh, kind of processor does this have? Is it an 8 plus Gen 1 or just an 8 Gen I 1? I think so. Let me double check. <laughs> I'm like realizing that I'm totally blanking on that right now. Uh, <laughs> yes. Sorry, folks. Should have done my research. It's, it is, right? It, it's the 8 plus Gen 1. Yeah. That makes sense. It's that yep. time of year. We're going to get all the 8 plus Gen 1s. Exactly. Uh, little, little, little hint, folks. I have an 8 plus Gen 1 phone in my hands right now. I can't tell you what it is, but ooh, <laughs> ooh, hotness. Mystery. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I know. Watch out. Those benchmarks are going to be delicious. Mostly what I'm seeing is what Qualcomm actually promised, which is exciting which is because they're using TSMC and not Samsung uh, as a fab, we're seeing gains in battery life and in power management. I'm in glad general. that was going to be my first question. If you're it's, seeing it's actual gains. minor, yeah. but it's noticeable. Also gains in heat management and, uh, you know, sustained performance. So I think this is really the eight gen one, what it should have been now. Yeah. You know, I hate to say that because obviously Qualcomm's worked really hard on both chips, but like, this is my preliminary, uh, you know, evaluation and it matches what we experienced when we went to Qualcomm's, uh, summit in San Diego a few, few months ago to, uh, test out the eight plus gen one behind closed doors. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. So, uh, basically this Xiaomi 12 series, 12 S I think is interesting. The, um, other two, are, there's a pro and just a regular. And, you know, the pro inherits some of like the same awesome, you know, LTPO version two display, AMOLED, quad HD than the uh, ultra, but it doesn't have uh, the camera set up. So it, it has a, a good camera set up, but it's right. uh, like Sony IMX 707, which is a 50 megapixel sensor, which is very similar to the IMX 766 that we're seeing becoming the new 586. You know, like everybody's right. picking the 766 now, especially all the BBK group companies and right. the Chinese makers. Um, so that's not bad. 1.2 microns on those. Uh, and then there's a telephoto and uh, an ultra wide on that one as well. Also tuned by Leica. Uh, and then, you know, uh, the battery is not as trick. But it does charge at 120 watts. So I bet you that's the older dual cell system they've had for a while. Because I reviewed the first 120 watt phone from Xiaomi for Geekspin for Elena's blog. Uh, when was it? Uh, last fall, it was the Xiaomi 11T Pro. Pro. And it had, it was amazing. It was the first time I had a phone with more than 100 or more than 80 watt. And I just played yeah. it in. It was like 17 minutes, 17 minutes from wow. zero to 100. That's crazy. Yeah. That's yeah. amazing. And both of these phones, by the way, have wireless charging, which is exciting, the Pro and the Ultra. And now, of course, the S goes down to a 45 milliamp hour battery, uh, but, and, and it goes to, a, a, I think, a 1080p smaller. Oh, 6.2 inches. Oh, mm. A small flagship. I know. I was going to say, it's kind of hard to find. Well, for a time, it was harder to find smaller sized Android phones, but it seems like that's kind of changing now. I'm excited. Oh yeah. my God. I mean, I personally like the bigger screen. Yes. Uh, by the way, I have to an update. My spouse, Theo, has been using a Z Flip 3 recently. Oh. Um, they're an iPhone user, but they fell in love with the, the Flip series. So uh, I bought them one because now that we live in two countries, we have two phone numbers. Oh. And for me, it's never a big deal because I have a million phones I can swap SIMs in. But for them, it's the first time they're living with two SIM cards. You're going to say you can dual SIM, you could eSIM on the iPhone, but you know, that's too much work. Right. So they like the idea of having two phones and they're like, they come up to me the other day, they're like, honey... I like the big screen. And I'm like, <laughs> sucker. <laughs> no, but I mean, I'm laughing, but because the only reason they do is because they can close it. Yes. Right? 
So this is a big deal, folks. I think this is, if you see an iPhone user, longtime iPhone user, pine for a folding phone, get one, and then go, oh, I'm loving it because it's a big screen, you know Samsung's doing something right. So Yeah, no, I I love the Z Flip 3. I've used it here and there. I haven't really used it as my daily driver. I've kind of just used it to kind of like play around with it here and there. But um, but I mean, I think the design is just one of the best that we've seen in a foldable phone so far. I think if it gets just a little bit cheaper, um, they'll they'll really have like a good shot at at replacing some of the the standard flagships. Yeah, and then they were like, so do, like I have to be careful, right? Because it's a folding phone, like I can't <laughs> use it in the rain. And I'm like, honey, it's water resistant. Yeah. And they're like, oh my God, are you kidding me? That <laughs> thing is water resistant. I'm like, look, don't use it in the tub, okay? Like, don't drop it yeah, in the tub. Yeah, don't like purposefully drop it in water, right? But if it spills or rains on it, since Vancouver, where they spend most of their time, is rainy, like, I'm like, you'll be probably fine. Just make sure you dry it. I'm like, yeah. Boom. You know, it's a different world. iPhone users are just not used to this stuff. I mean, obviously, water resistance is a normal on iPhones. Uh, just so you know where they're coming from, iPhone SE. Oh, wow. A that second is a gen. Big so the, jump. Yeah. <laughs> the slightly bigger one, but without 5G. Yeah, big that's, jump. That's still right? a really big jump in size, yeah. though. Yeah. yeah. So they're playing all their games on the Z Flip 3 now. <laughs> Honestly, one of my best friends has a Z Flip 3. She bought it on, I think it was Black Friday around the holidays, and she absolutely loves it. And she loves to take photos. So I think that was like the big appeal for her was, you know, when there's no one around to take a group picture, she just kind of, you know, props it up in flex mode and finds like a table or something nearby. Um, and, you know, it's, it's really useful, honestly. Like it's much easier than having to find, you know, something to prop up your phone on nearby. Um, but yeah, I'm curious to see where Samsung goes next with the Z Flip. Uh, we'll have to wait a little while, I guess. <laughs> I mean, frankly, it was such, I think it's one of those phones we're going to look back on as a turning point phone. Yeah. Because of the original flips were great. Like I had both the Flip and the 5G version. And they were fine, but this thing is just so delightful. It's such a step up, right? Yeah. Like water for sure. resistance, the bigger front screen, the you know, the better design. And more importantly, it has, you know, this price point that I mean a thousand you can you basically you pick between S twenty two or S twenty one. Yeah. And and back then and then the flip and so it's gonna be tough for them to beat that. Like I honestly want to set my expectations low that this is just going to be a very evolutionary step yeah and honestly i'm not going to be mad if that is um you know just a newer chip maybe a slightly improved camera system yeah i think as long as they keep most of the important specs on par with the flagship galaxy s series i think people have no problem you know paying a little bit more not a crazy amount more, but a little bit more for a foldable phone. Because, you know, I do remember that being like some of the drawbacks of the first Galaxy Z Flip was that, okay, you're paying all of this money for the screen mostly, which is great. But at the same time, if you're paying a lot of money, you don't want to compromise on things, you know, like the camera and everything else that you would expect to get with a phone that's that expensive, right? So I think as long 100%. as they can do a good job of, of keeping them kind of side by side, um, I think it'll have a, a, a pretty good shot at, you know, catching on with people. Yeah, so this tangent, which I love, this is yes, what the show is all know, about. This exactly. tangent on display size is just to point out that the the 10s is a pretty smallish flagship, six point two eight inches. You know, I personally be fine with that, um, but again, I prefer bigger size. But it's nice to see them making phones. You know, I know a lot of folks are going to say that's way too small. Look at the iPhone 13 Mini, right? Yeah. Granted, yes. Anyway, this. Um, display size tangent brought to you by my patreon i just want to remind everyone that if you want to watch this podcast instead of listen to it you know the audio version is free comes out on sundays a day or two before that you can get a video version where sometimes we show some phones and uh it's a little raw like i don't edit it as much you know i don't clean it up as much but also comes out sooner. And so if you want to be one of the first to listen or watch the podcast, you should join the Patreon, patreon.com slash T-N-K-G-R-L, Tank Girl, just like my Twitter handle. And there's a bunch of other tiers there. I'll let you discover it. I just want to put it in the middle of the show because I think a lot of people just don't listen to the end, you know, where I do the outro and tell everybody about everything. And and don't worry, Lisa, you're going to get a chance to to tell everybody where they can find you then. But... um. The other piece of news today, I mean this week, 
was the ROG Phone 6 coming out. So I want to pick your brain about gaming phones. What are your thoughts on gaming phones? Yeah, you know, gaming phones are really interesting to me. I, you know, I I think as flagship phones and even like mid-tier phones get better and better we're going to be seeing more of these phones like you know the the rog phone 6 and other gaming phones and photography phones and phones that are kind of more i guess targeted towards like more niche audiences and that are designed for specialized circumstances and i think gaming phones has been one of like the most interesting areas um, of growth in, in that type of space that we've seen and for me personally i don't play mobile games enough to to really be a, a gaming phone person and you know it it's partially just because I'm, I'm more of a console person, to be honest. I don't even play my right. Switch handheld that much unless I'm like on the train or something or if someone else is using the TV and I really want to play something. Um, but I think what interests me the most about gaming phones is seeing where some of these advancements might eventually trickle down to regular phones because, you know, high refresh rates, for example, you know, 120 hertz is kind of normal on a lot of like high end flagship pro ish level phones now. And yeah. that's something that we start, we saw first on gaming phones. Right. So I think, you know, you see a lot of the most exciting developments in, you know, display technology, refresh rates and, and battery life and cooling systems. You get all of that in gaming phones first. And I'm, I'm curious to see how that impacts the way the rest of the industry thinks about, you know, improving those aspects in, in regular phones too. Yeah, and I feel the same way. Like, it's not something I would use. and But I understand there's an entire world of folks out there who don't have the space or, you know, are living in markets where PCs and consoles are almost too expensive and unattainable and they have to make a choice. Yeah. And, you know, mobile gaming is is a thing. There's tournaments out there. There's an entire universe out there. So, oh, yeah. Right? So I think this is totally cool. And, uh, but it's, you know, it's not for me. and. I think, you know, I played with this phone a little bit. Uh, one of my colleagues uh, had it under embargo during a recent trip that I've made. And I, you don't have to say, I play with a lot of phones and all the gaming phones as well. I have one coming soon to, to try out. And I think this phone is one of the more versatile, like more uh, well-rounded of the gaming phones I've used. Like it, there's still, like the cameras are getting to the point on these now where they're Mid range ish plus, like they're they're yeah. completely fine. And that's Whereas fine in the for past, a lot of people, yeah, yeah, in the past, gaming phone cameras, you're like, no, you really want a separate <laughs> phone, right? Yeah, like this is moving, this is changing, and I think that you're right. A lot of technologies, like the high refresh rate, the cooling solution that are employed mm -hmm. in these that are keeping your standard Galaxy S series cold, right, and and happy. These things are all coming from the gaming phone world, and so. I think it's cool. There's basically two models here. Both have Snapdragon 8 Plus Gen 1. There is a 165 hertz display that's LTPO on both as well. Again, this is pretty far par for the course on most um, gaming phones these days, right? But, uh, you know, it's a, it's obviously just a 1080p display, but the, the touch latency is kind of amazing. 720 hertz, that's the lowest, I think, 23 milliseconds. That's the lowest I've seen. Uh, I think there's other gaming phones that have come close. I've, I think I've seen something like 600 or something. But anyway, the the point is this is this is what's about, and it's got trigger buttons, and you've got like one of them has a, a display in the back that you can customize. Oh and, yeah, I know. saw that. That's cool. Yeah, so I think basically for me, you know, I, I look at this and I'm like, yeah, if you're a gamer and you want the, I think the best gaming phone, the most well-rounded and also the most probably the most expensive asus has always delivered that and uh, you know you can get the red magics we're talking about the fact that the red magic 7s pro is about to launch but i mean you know or you can also get a black shark which is a little more affordable which is xiaomi's uh, yeah. gaming phone brand but i kind of feel that asus has really managed to get in early and keep at the top of their game whereas you remember razor got into yes, that business and they that <laughs> just did not they just did not survive because China and Taiwan just <laughs> kept kicking their butts, basically. I think it's about the timing, too. Like I said before, I think we're at a point now where, you know, new phones can be a little bit boring sometimes, you know. Sometimes you just get a, a minor processor upgrade, some, you know, a few little camera improvements. But I think 
in general, that's a really good thing for the smartphone industry because it means that even cameras on older phones or mid-range phones have gotten really good. So when you look at something like a gaming phone, you know, a company like Asus can afford to say, hey, you know, we're going to put all of our efforts into things like the display and the battery. And, you know, even if we kind of cut back on the camera a little bit, that camera is still going to be pretty good to the point where you don't have to compromise, you know, just like you mentioned earlier. So I do feel like now we're at a point where this is the right time for phones like this that are really specialized because one, it'll help them stand out because we know it's really hard for new phones to kind of stand out these days and bring something new to the table. And two, the technology has just gotten a lot better where you don't have to invest so much in like the camera and, you know, some of these other aspects to to still have something that's that's really useful. So. Hundred percent. So the the only difference here between the pro and non pro is that display in the back and the amount of RAM. Let's talk about that for one second. Eighteen gigs of RAM. Yeah, that's a lot. <laughs> like I don't know what I would do with that. <laughs> honestly, I'm happy with eight. Twelve is a nice bonus because it feels like I can multitask a little better. Apps don't have to reload. But uh, sixteen, I've seen. I've 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 used phones with sixteen, but eighteen, like I'm like I'm lost. Like I'm like serious. Like I don't. <laughs> I don't know. Maybe, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe somebody can comment and tell me, like, do we need 18 gigs of RAM? I, as a point of reference, this iMac that's recording right now in my office, it's an older Intel iMac. It's going to get retired soon when uh, oh God, I hope Apple makes a 27 or 30 inch iMac. That's what I'm waiting for. Yeah. Um, if not, I'm just going to buy a, a Mac mini M2 when that comes out and get a 5K display or something. But, but the, tangent but the the point is i have 16 gigs in this and it needs it because it's a crappy intel mac i have eight gigs on my m1 macbook air eight yeah and i don't even notice like i think it's because the ssd is so fast that it swaps in and out of ssd really fast so you know you're gonna say different right pickup truck versus tiny little lightweight sports car which is (laughs) what this is right but at the same time i'm like do you really need more than 12 Probably not. Yeah, I was wondering that too. It sounds really impressive on paper, but I don't know how much of a difference it actually makes. And I'm also curious, to be honest, I haven't tested a gaming phone. Some of my colleagues have. I know we've reviewed the the Red Magic 7 and, you know, the Asus ROG Phone 5. Um, But I'm just curious about how different playing games really does feel on phones like this. Because ideally, you know, any app you can get from the Google Play Store should run pretty well on almost any Android phone, right? So I'm wondering how much of a difference that, you know, things like the refresh rate, you know, really make, especially since there aren't really that many games that are optimized for the, you know, 165 hertz uh, refresh rate. I know there's Mm -hmm. a couple out there, but it's not, it's certainly not common. So yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I'm, I'm curious about what that's like. So my time with the uh, ROG Phone 6 Pro, the brief bit I used it, it felt, you know how these OnePlus phones at their apogee of Oxygen OS before it became ColorOS reskinned into Oxygen OS? Think um, OnePlus 7T, OnePlus 8, 8 Pro, sure. that, that period of time. Um, how they almost felt telepathic to use, like you... Everything was just so smooth and so Ooh, telepathic. Perfect. I like that. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it just like felt like your fingers were moving, but the phone was almost there before you could think yeah. of what you wanted to do. That phone feels like that. And and I feel like that's the difference between that and like say an S22, which is super competent and fast, but it doesn't give you that there's like a tiny little delay still yeah. that you feel. And OnePlus achieves that by optimization because at the time they didn't have a 720 hertz touch sample rate and a 165 hertz display, right? But at the same time, you know, I think this is important because, you know, we're, we're seeing that, you know, throwing a little bit better hardware at things and optimizing your software just a little bit. Asus is not an expert at optimizing software. Right. But but obviously pays off. And there's a few high-end phones I've used recently that felt like that to me. They were like, okay, this is bonkers fast. Like better than the average, you know, flagship Android phone. And I think this is something only people like you and I can experience, right? Because right. we touch all these different phones and it all becomes very relative very quickly. So yeah, uh, speaking of gaming phones, as I mentioned, the Red Magic 7S series is going to launch on July 11th in China. I just, you know, I just put it in there because we're talking gaming phones and 
you know, every we don't know anything about this phone. It's it's you know the the S the seven S Pro at least should be an, uh, the same as the seven Pro, based on what Red Magic does usually, which is just come out with a new processor and change nothing else. That doesn't even change the industrial design. We we can pretty much expect that the seven S Pro of this series will have the same specs as the seven Pro with a Snapdragon eight plus Gen one, right? Yeah, and uh, that. Weird under display camera is going to remain, <laughs> which is pretty bad on this, my, the 7 Pro that I have, I used and tested. It's, it's the same camera that's on the ZT, uh, ZT uh, Axon 40 Ultra or whatever, the one okay, that yeah. sold, sells in the US. And it it's, uh, gives you that, you know, soft, glowing soap opera look right uh, <laughs> maybe some people like that i don't know <laughs> wah, wah, wah. to be honest though it's very hard to see the the cutout in the display they did a very good job at hiding it like unlike you know the the fold three which you can really tell there's something under there yeah so on one hand they hit it well but on the other hand the performance is ugh. um so you know but again this is remember nubia is related to zte zte whatever you want to say and so it's probably the same camera system and the same under display technology. And, you know, this phone, the Red Magics always end up being sold in the US with compatible 5G bands. Now, Sasha, I can hear Sasha in my corner, <laughs> in my back of my head. They're going, Miriam, you know better. And I'm like, no, look, okay, look, like not everyone needs all the bands, okay? I know that Sasha is very strict. Yes. A phone sold in the US should have all the bands. Otherwise, he'll sneer at it and not even touch it. But uh, come on, like, you know, there's a big difference between that, that Xiaomi phone we just talked about that's going to, I'm going to probably get a review in it. And maybe if I'm lucky, one 5G ban on T-Mobile will work versus the, the Red Magics, pretty much all the 5G phones they've made, you know, work just fine on T-Mobile, probably okay on low band Verizon and and sometimes on AT&T and dip, like if you have mid band on AT&T. So I think this is kind of where... You know, to me, I have kind of wiggle room on that, right? Right. I don't know about you, but if you're going to be an early adopter, tech savvy folk, well, you're going to live with that. You're going to be fine. Yes, you're going to have to deal with those, you know, compromises here and there. (laughs) And the nice thing is Red Magic officially sells these here. It's not like, you know, you have to go like import it or something. Right. Um, Speaking of OnePlus, we talked about Oxygen OS earlier. You know, there's been all these rumors about this this, uh, OnePlus 10T. We We didn't get a 10, we got a 10 Pro, which was launched in a very problematic way, in my opinion, because it was so uh, China first. And then they kind of like the the cat was out of the bag and it spoiled the fun for for everyone here, in my opinion. Like it's a great phone. It was kind of a strange approach, I thought too, because correct me if I'm wrong. I think I was covering some other things at the time, but they kind of like trickled out the details slowly instead of just outright announcing it, right? Yeah, it was a bit of a mess because yeah. they launched it in China first. So some reviewers imported one from China where it runs a different OS than Oxygen. So it, I think it runs ColorOS, just, just you know, yeah. base ColorOS there. And it's just interesting to me because it's like, okay, like you've always launched your phones in North America and Europe first. What are you doing, OnePlus? Yeah, like, it, it did seem out of character for them to do it that way. Well, it's because Oppo, right? Oppo runs yeah. the game now. And, and, you know, Pete Lau is like, this is going to be the way it's going to be. OnePlus is just another sub-brand now. Yeah. Deal with it. But I feel like they've lost something because of it. So there was no 10, and now we have a 10T, but no 10T Pro rumored. So eh, hedge your bets, I guess. <laughs> I mean, we all know it's going to have an 8 Plus Gen 1, right? That's given. This is the season. Right, uh, exactly. But the price just leaked on Amazon UK, and it's seven ninety nine for... Uh, 8 gigs, 128 gig. 128 gigs seems low for that price, but it's yeah. 799 pounds, which means it'll probably be 799 US. <laughs> Don't yeah, I mean, it's, I think the price is okay. Honestly, I feel like OnePlus in recent years has kind of strayed from being, you know, now I feel like they're just another flagship phone brand now in terms right. of like the pricing and what they have to offer. They're not as much, they're not as cheap as they used to be. And I, I don't know. I mean, I feel like it, it was... What they were doing when they first launched around like 2014, 2015, I felt like probably wasn't sustainable over the long term because it was just an insane deal. It was like too good to be true for what you were getting at that point in time. So it's not surprising, but I don't know. I I would like to see, 
I know a hundred dollar difference is, is a really big deal for a lot of people out there, but I would like to see a bigger price gap. I feel like, you know, below 800, I think would be a really interesting price point for, for like a different, you know, a, a cheaper version of the 10 pro, but, um, but yeah, we'll see. I don't know. Yeah. I feel the same way as you. I, I'm just curious what, since it's not a pro, what they've removed because the, the pro to me is it's pro in name only. Like it's yeah. what I feel a complete flagship should be. There's a telephotos, there's an ultra wide, there's a main sensor. They're all high quality. There's a partnership with Hasselblad, which may or may not matter, but it certainly does. You know, I feel like in gen two of Hasselblad partnership for one plus, which is very equivalent in terms of color science to the gen one Hasselblad on Oppo, which we found on the Find X five pro is actually pretty good. They are finally delivering something that I feel is, is, you know, makes it maybe worth having that brand, uh, you know, exercise going yeah. at that partnership. But I'm just wondering, like, if this is not a pro, are we going to get like a, an ultra wide or regular and then some two megapixel sticker cam, like I like to call them. It might as well be a sticker <laughs> on the back of your phone, you know, right. like, uh, like a macro or some terrible depth oh of monochrome I know, sensor. It's like, don't even call it a camera at that point. Like, <laughs> And so I'm worried that that's what they're going to pull. At $7.99, honestly, it says fits the equivalent U.S. pricing because, you know, they don't translate. Prices don't translate, like, yeah. directly like that. So if this becomes, like, a Timo phone, you know, uh, at that price with that storage and RAM and has, you know, the, where the third camera is not some kind of, like, F you from, <laughs> from OnePlus, <laughs> I'll be on board. But it better have all the other things, like wireless charging and metal... Yeah chassis and a glass back you know all that good stuff that water we expect, resistance yeah. water resistance that we saw on the 10 pro so if you can have all that at 7.99 you know and apparently it's got you know of course a quality display i think it's very evolutionary <sighs> yeah it's just it's just not undercutting apple and samsung in the way that it used to on price which you know it has i feel like it's been that way for a while but um, but yeah, I'm really curious about the camera because I do feel like that's the one, that's the first place a lot of these companies start to compromise when it comes to launching a cheaper version. Um, and I know in our review of the OnePlus 10 Pro, you know, we we really liked the camera aside from, you know, the zoom quality and the night mode. Um, we didn't think was quite as good as some of the other flagships, but yeah. I think a lot of people are are kind of okay with that, um, depending on what your needs are. So, but I, but I wouldn't want to see anything, you know, worse on like the 10t so i don't know we'll, ha we'll have to see yeah so let's hope that they don't mess it up too much is all i'm saying i am bummed though that there is no third player anymore like one plus look like it might be the third yeah. option in 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 this market i'm you know lg's gone moto of course exists but you know they keep messing up the initial pricing which makes it <laughs> hard for us to review the it phone, does right? it is a challenge um because we review them and say yeah look at the price don't buy it and then like all i have to do is come out at a more reason since it's all going to be on sale anyway right like, come out at a reasonable price to get go i think moto is potentially still a contender here uh but they just need to try a little harder with their pricing and oneplus needs to try a little harder with being themselves and not just an Oppo clone. Yeah, I agree um, with that. So, but it's still going to be hard to convince people to not buy Z Flip 3 after they see how awesome it is. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> like, or to be like not caring about phones. Like it's like people who don't care about cars. It's just an appliance to them. And they walk into the care store and they're, they're a Samsung user and they're just going to buy another S22 because of right. course they are because they bought an S20 like two years ago, right? It's like, yep. So I don't know. I kind of want more choices for the average person. I want more choices that you walk in the store and go like, oh, I saw that ad on TV for that new whatever, right? That's not a Samsung or an iPhone. And it's set, it's sitting there in the in the pile. And, and the salesperson is not trying to steer you to an iPhone or Samsung phone, yeah, which is I wonder, what's happening, you know? No, I agree. Um, you know, it's, in, here in the US, it's definitely like a, a two horse race between Apple and Samsung. And it has been for a long time. And I agree. I would love to see a really promising third contender. It seems like Google is kind of taking that role, but they still don't have a lot yeah, of market the, share. The presence really. is so, you know, I, I agree with you. Google is there, but I think Google is yeah. there in kind of the tech savvy early adopter universe in the same way, I guess, as OnePlus was, but for a little while there, for a brief moment, I felt like with the 8 and 8 Pro, they really were starting to get somewhere where they were 
more mainstream than the Pixel phones somehow. Now I think they're kind of back to being Pixel-like. And the Pixels have so many issues. Like I have a 6 Pro as my main phone and I haven't had a lot of the software bugs that people are experiencing. But I am, I'm finding myself getting more and more annoyed with it. Oh yeah. Like I don't like, it's just like battery life seems to be worse suddenly. Mm -hmm. I'm having a lot of reception issues, but I'm not having a lot of the other bugs that people are seeing. So maybe I'm lucky. Yeah, but this I is not really acceptable. It's not acceptable yeah. for a phone like that. You know, galaxies are rock solid. Like, how can Google not? They they make Android. <laughs> I mean, I ranted no, about I this. I ranted about this on the last show, and I think honestly, I have a very big finger to point at one culprit for this, and that's <laughs> Tensor Chip. That's that's Samsung. <laughs> all the radio, all the reception and radio issues I'm experiencing, I'm pretty convinced are because of that subpar 5G radio that's a year and a half old that's in that chipset. And, you know, like transitions between Wi-Fi calling and not, like little things like that that are just not as rock solid. Like, I'll Those place are the a call. important things, though. Like you shouldn't notice things like that. They should just exactly. work, you know? Exactly. So, yeah, like, if you're noticing it, then that's a problem. Day to day, my phone works and it's fast and it does the job and the camera yeah. is superb, but battery life seems to be getting worse. And that's generally doesn't happen until after two years or so for me. Yeah. And then the other thing I'm running into is like weird things. Like I want to place a call and a call doesn't go through or, or, and, and I try again and it works. I'm like, it should try, it should work the first time. I got five bars of signal. I'm on Timo. I've been, and yeah. I live in the same place for 20 years. I know my signal is good here. Right. Like, uh, anyway. No, so I feel like. Tensor is part of the problem. And I feel like the Qualcomm versions of the Pixel, like even last year's 5A, man, that phone, so good, so rock solid, nothing wrong with it. Yeah. And that's kind of one of my Pixels to be, okay? Well, it's kind I know of funny I, because like- I'm asking for yeah. two different things here, I know, but- <laughs> Well, I feel like there's like a trade-off, right? It's, you know, on one hand, Pixels are a little bit more exciting now because of this big- redesign with tensor that that google has done and it's interesting to see them putting more of their own stamp on their phones like they probably should have for a really long time and there are some things that i really like about tensor like the new camera stuff is awesome you know some of it for sure some of it is available on other phones too but i i really love i forget the the technical name but you know the feature where if, if someone's moving and it kind of freezes their face so that it's not I don't blurry. remember the name but I, I know exactly what you're talking but about. But that is awesome. I have not been able to find something like that on another phone and you know it's it's great. And I like that Google I I've always personally liked that Google has found interesting little ways to kind of improve the phone experience with like you know their different call screening features and holds for me like that kind of stuff makes phones feel interesting again but if you can't get the basics right so then it's yeah. all for nothing really like if you're having bugs with phone calls and switching between wi-fi and cellular and you know the fingerprint sensor isn't very fast and you know all of those or battery life is starting to deteriorate like those are all things that sound minor at first aside from the battery life but you're not going to want to use that phone if those things keep happening it's just you, those are things you shouldn't notice you know 100 percent and You know, overall, I have to say I'm still pretty happy. I just feel like I'm nitpicking a bit because I just feel like Tensor isn't quite there. And I really hope they can fix it with Tensor 2. And and kind of secretly, I hate to say this, but I'm wishing this had had a Dimensity 9000 or like a Snapdragon 8 Gen 1 and call it a day. Like, I just don't feel confident about the Samsung, you know, based chipsets. In the same way as Exynos has always been problematic for our friends in Europe. Yeah, well, you know what? It's funny that you bring that up because as someone in the US, I usually don't get to use the Samsung Exynos versions of phones, but the Galaxy A53 5G had an Exynos chip in it, even though it was a US phone. And I did actually, that was like the first Samsung phone that I had noticed some performance issues. And I loved pretty much everything else about the phone for the price. I thought it was a really good mid-range phone, but every once in a while, especially when I would, you know, reboot the phone or turn it on or, or wake it up after not using it for a little while it would get kind of slow and buggy and again that's not something that you should notice like performance at this point can almost be a little bit difficult to evaluate in a phone because usually modern smartphones just work really well for everyday tasks right but when you do notice stuttering and lag that's when there's kind of a red flag there that you know okay maybe this is something that 
that is a little bit problematic. So I don't know. For sure. And I think you're absolutely right. And I think it's also over time, right? We always review them. They're like brand new. We've had them yes. for a week. Like, so of we stress test them great. for yeah. a week. They're going to be perfect. Like wait three months, six mm -hmm. months. And pixels have always been slightly problematic in aging, right? Um, speaking of BBK Group and OnePlus, Realme is one of my darlings lately in the last few years. They've really stepped up their game. And, you know, there's a bunch of phones that are coming out from them. They're design-wise, they're a little over the top, but really cool and fun. Because you know what? Yes, as Michael Fisher, Mr. Mobile says, you know, when phones were fun, these days seem to be over <laughs> other than folding phones. But here's the thing. Not everybody has the money or the expertise to make or buy a folding phone. So why not give us dumb slab phones, boring, basic glass and plastic phones, but they're cool looking and have cool designs. And Realme's really done that, like racing stripes on their phone. Of course, I could do without the dare to leap on everything, which is their <laughs> slogan. But look, the reality is they're making some solid phones lately. Not that they haven't before, but they're really pushing the envelope. The prices are low. They're putting OIS on almost everything with good sensors. And it's, it's the BBK imaging pipeline. So it's actually pretty solid. It's not bad. It's not like compromised, not just OIS, a checkbox that you check, right? It's actually useful. And this latest teaser from Realme is for their new flagship, which I presume, since it's the season, will have an 8 Plus Gen 1, and is called the GT2, and again, the naming for Realme is always, always interesting, GT2 Explorer Master Edition, and look at this design. The it is yeah. brown <laughs> anodized aluminum edges. It's not, it's metal, but it's it looks like a... It looks like, I guess they were saying it like a travel trunk and it totally does. Yeah, no, I agree. And you kind of beat me to it, but I was going to say, I really, I really love the look of this phone. I don't know if it's my taste personally, but I just love the fact that it actually looks different and it looks more unique. And I feel like it's the kind of phone that if you have it out on the train or you're walking around with it, people will probably stop and ask you what it is because it just looks so different. So I, I, I love seeing that in, in new phones. And you know, what's interesting. So this this isn't meant to be like a rugged phone, is it? Because like the, no. the name, even though it's not supposed to be the name and, and the look of it. Implies um, it? Kind of yeah, implies no. that a little bit. But but it looks really nice, honestly. Um, I, I think that the camera module is interesting. It's uh, it's definitely very pronounced. Uh, you know, that, that main camera out on the back is really big. But um, but I, I love the, the edges and everything. I think it's a really unique looking phone. And again, that is not something that's easy to do these days. No, and that's why I got me so excited because I'm like, okay, this flagship's going to be pretty, really affordable. The specs are going to be on point. It's going to have everything you need, the latest processor, things like a Snapdragon 8 Plus. You know, it's going to have like a, a decent camera system with OIS, like a, probably a, the, the ubiquitous IMX 766. But that's a good, that's a good thing. And, you know, it might not have wireless charging. That's probably something it won't have because typically that's the Realmes don't have that. And I'm okay with that because you know what? It's going to be something like six ninety nine or something, you know? Right. Um, so anyway, I'm excited about this one. I love the design. And again, you know, it doesn't have to be a rugged phone to look this way. It doesn't even have to be, it just doesn't have to be a black slab of glass. Exactly. In the back, you know, like, hello, Samsung Galaxy S22 Ultra, the most boring, awesome phone there is. You know, like the phone itself is bonkers good. Like, I love that phone. I do so much with it. A lot of my photography for product is taken with the S22 Ultra, especially the car stuff I do. But you know what? I really like the kind of like the angular look to the Ultra. I think that kind of makes it unique. Like it's still a black slab, but I, I really like, I don't know, like the, the boxy note like look is, is really interesting to me. So I'm glad that they kind of kept that around. Yeah, I, I love that about the S22 Ultra. I like that it's a note, essentially. You yes, know? me too. <laughs> With that really hot design. But this thing, man, I can't wait for this thing. The good news is, folks, I have one on the way. So stay tuned. <laughs> All right. The next thing quickly on the list, we've got a couple of more articles. I think they're not super important, but I feel like I want your take on this. There's rumors that we're going to get uh, basically Android lock screen screen ads coming um and you know what i linked to the completely the wrong article i don't know what i'm talking about but <laughs> <laughs> in the in the email i sent you but anyway basically there was this thing that happened this week that some company that google 
acquired, I think. I think I don't think whatever. they acquired. I think maybe they they had invested in them or something like that. That's it. But yeah, don't quote me on that. I would have to double check. And so is is it is it something like we basically the carriers might partner with that company to bring us ads on the lock screen? That sounds like a complete nightmare to me. Yeah, you know what? My first thought when I saw that was like, oh no, this is bloatware coming back, but like with a vengeance because it's on your lock screen this time and not right. like hidden in the and app drawer. And phones, which is what everybody in this country uses, right? Exactly, yeah. So, so it's like, oh no. I really hope it's an optional type of thing. I don't want to go back to that. We finally moved away from bloatware on most phones through carriers. I, I don't want this coming back in, in a, a different way. And, you know, another thing that came to mind for me too was, you know, I feel like the lock screen is so personal. Like it's the one it's place. It's so secret, right? Yeah, it's the one place you can escape ads on your phone. You know, the app stores and most apps you use will have ads, especially if they're free. So, you know, this is the the one place where we're kind of safe from that. So yeah. I, I, I really hope that if this does happen, it's a optional thing. Something that you don't need to do. I don't know. Maybe it'll be kind of like the Kindle way of doing things where you, you can get, get a discount. Yeah, like you where choose you get a to discount. give away your life on your lock screen <laughs> and you get a discount. And, but I hate, I hate to do that too because, I mean, the reality is, you know, what it affects the most is people that have low income, right? Yeah. Yeah. People with low income, like I think this is going to be a nightmare for the prepaid market because they already have these phones that are mm, kind of meh. Right. And the carers kind of push them on you if you're on Metro or whatever. I'm not right. singling out T-Mobile here, but I'm just saying it doesn't matter, like cricket, whatever. And the next thing you know, is like, oh, you can get a five dollar discount every month if you agree to this lock screen thing. Oh, man, that on like a Moto G. Oh, painful. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Like, I don't want the carriers deciding, you know, what the first thing I'm going to see is when I tap my phone, you know, like that's for me. <laughs> But more importantly, I, I imagine somebody who's on a budget who doesn't yeah. really understand or know, and they get kind of pushed into this, and then they have a terrible user experience because of it. And it's going to affect, again, people with low income more than us. We're going to be like, no, I'll pay For the extra sure. five bucks, no ads on my lock screen, screw you, Verizon, or whatever it might be. Sorry, George. <laughs> Didn't mean to single you guys out. But I mean, the, the point is, look, you know, I always like to have fun with Verizon. George knows. Okay. Um, last thing is... This is very, very kind of inside baseball because, you know, I cover EVs and car tech. Geely is a major, major Chinese car manufacturer, and they're probably the number one EV manufacturer in the world, especially if you consider that they also make buses and taxis that are used all over China. But Geely also owns Volvo and Polestar, Polestar being like the electric Volvo sub-brand. And so here's what's interesting. Meizu is a company that came out around the same time as Xiaomi back like 15 yeah, to 12 years ago. A blast from the and past, yeah. <laughs> yes, and they made a lot of really interesting affordable, like they were kind of competing for like that budget affordable Android thing that Xiaomi started and that eventually BBK joined and and is now a thing. And now these brands all have flagships that are super fancy, but also have these sub brands like, you know, Redmi and Poco on 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 the Xiaomi side and like Realme and and Vivo and others on the BBK side. And so Meizu somehow never spawned those sub brands and kind of didn't make it. Like they they've been struggling for a while. They they're just not competitive, but they still exist. And Geely has basically bought them out, majority stake anyway. And it's interesting because to me, you know, there's this incredible parallel between electrification and what I call the iPadification of cars, you know, where cars are becoming essentially iPads on wheels. Yeah, right? yeah. And now, you know, we're seeing, we've seen phone manufacturers supposedly, allegedly making cars, right? Apple, right, has been working on a car for how long now? Huawei has been working and building cars, uh, Huawei branded cars out there. Now, I don't think they actually build them, but all the technology is Huawei in them. You know, Sony announced an electric car that apparently is going to go to market, you know. Um, yeah. So, so all that stuff. So to me, this is like the reverse. So this is like car makers that are going like, mm, we need more mobile expertise. We need to acquire that iPadness, right? And they're partnering with phone companies. Yeah, no, that was like my first immediate reaction to this as well was that, okay, you know, it seems like the car really has become like the next frontier for a lot of 
tech companies and smartphone companies. I think, you know, a lot of these companies like, you know, Apple, you know, Google with Android Auto and whatever, like are trying to meet people where they are and, and kind of, um, you know, we're all, every all of these tech companies are competing for our eyeballs in one way or another. And I think that's part of the motivation to kind of move into the car. But I think on the flip side, like you mentioned, a lot of car makers realize that, hey, we need to have better technology in our cars to stay competitive. And I think that's kind of, in my opinion, where this, you know, acquisition or controlling, yeah, controlling stake kind of seemed appealing to Geely is like, okay, well, this smartphone company that isn't doing so well, you know, there's probably a really good way we can repurpose their technology in our cars. So, um, and, you know, going back to what you were saying earlier about app, the Apple car or, or whatever they're supposedly working on. One thing that really stood out to me at WWDC was the new CarPlay OS, as I'm sure you also right. like that oh, just yeah. looked like a, and you know, a hybrid of the iPhone slash Apple watch operating system in your car. Right. So if that is any sign of the direction things are going in, I think you're going to see a lot of car makers trying to strike partnerships with companies like Apple and Google and whoever else to, to kind of get that experience. Yeah, no, this is just really caught my eye. So I wanted to just mention it, you know, everyone read that article from TechCrunch and uh, mull upon this thought and just decide what you think about it. Cause I think it's interesting. We should wrap up, but Lisa, do you want to tell folks where they can find you on the internet, your social media handles and maybe pimp your work on CNET or whatever? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So you can find me on Twitter at Lisa Edichico. That's L I S A E A D I C I C C O. Um, similarly, you can find me on CNET.com. Um, especially if you look at the mobile section under the tech page, you'll find a lot of my articles there um and yeah those are the two main places you can find me um so thank you again for having me on today's show absolutely you know where to find me folks i'm at tankgirl that's t-n-k-g-r-l on instagram and on twitter that's like tankgirl the comic book just drop the vowels you know i did the Flickr thing before Flickr did it ha uh, but the point is, if you want to discuss this with me and Lisa, hit us up on Twitter. If you want to see pretty pictures of all the new phones and of cars and EVs and stuff, look at my Instagram. All the photos are taken with phones, by the way. That's the gimmick. And then uh, youtube.com slash mobile tech podcast and youtube.com slash mobile tech more for the two YouTube channels related to the show. One is specifically on the phone ecosystem. The rest is all travel tech, car tech, home tech, all that stuff. And remember how YouTube works. Like, subscribe, tell your friends, click the little notification bell and comment. You can comment about the podcast as well. The other thing I want to point out is that if you're just listening and you love the show, subscribe. We're on all the major podcast platform. Uh, that's Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Pocket Cast, Spotify. And it's mobiletechpodcast.com the url so you can just also get the rss feed if you're like old school yeah so yes yeah, subscribe and if your app lets you rate or review the show please consider that i mentioned patreon if you want to help out that would be great like you can get a bunch of different perks through patreon patreon.com slash tankgirl that's patreon.com slash tnkgrl there's the video version of the podcast as i mentioned is one of the big tiers you get it earlier and it's on video and there's like a Discord channel you can join and chat with me. So there's a bunch of fun stuff there. Check out the Patreon. Join if you can. Help us out. It'd be great. If you don't like Patreon, cool. There's a link in the show notes. You can click and give me a PayPal donation so I can buy another one of these delicious coffees. Not sponsored. I'm holding up a can in case of you not watching. And then finally, I want to thank Audible. Audible, our sponsor. They're fantastic. They're there all the time for us. So... You know, I want to thank Audible for being our longtime sponsor and there is a deal for you. 30 day free trial. You get to keep a book at the end. If you like reading as much as I do, you should check out Audible if you're not already a member. AudibleTrial.com slash mobile tech is the URL. That's AudibleTrial.com slash mobile tech. So here's a quick deal on this. I read a lot, but I don't because my eyes are tired. I'm in front of the computer all day. So actually I listen to a lot of books on my headphones and earbuds, I chill back and relax. It's nice. That's what Audible is all about. If you like books, you like even podcasts, they have a bunch of those or some short form content. They have that as well. Basically, no matter whether you want an epic 12 hour thing or a short thing and you want it read to you and it's a book originally, that's Audible. This is very simple. Road trips, Audible. Listen to a whole bunch of books. Awesome. So check it out. 
help them help us and consider clicking through that link, audibletrial.com slash mobile tech. And that's it. I want to thank Audible again. And Lisa, thank you for being my guest. Really appreciate it. Of course. Happy to come on. This was a lot of fun. Well, we'll definitely have you on again at some point. And folks, you know we'll have another show next week. So stay tuned for that. Until then, cheers, everybody. This has been the Mobile Tech Podcast with Tank Girl, proudly presented by worldpodcasts.com. You can visit us online at mobiletechpodcast.com.